Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Herod the fox plotted against Christ to hinder the course of his ministry and mediatorship but he could not perform his enterprise. It is so all along. Therefore it is said, Why do the heathen imagine a vain thing? A vain thing, because a thing successless. Their hands could not perform it. It was vain, not only because there was no true ground of reason why they should imagine or do such a thing, but vain also because they labored in vain. They could not do it, and therefore it follows, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. The Lord sees what fools they are, and men, yea, themselves shall see it. The prophet gives us an eloquent description to this purpose in Isaiah 59, verses 5 and 6. They weave the spider's web. Their web shall not become garments neither shall they cover themselves with their works. As if he had said, they have been devising and setting things in a goodly frame to catch flies. They have been spinning a fine thread out of their brains, as the spider does out of her bowels. Such is their web. But when they have their web, they cannot cut it out or make it up into a garment. They shall go naked and cold, Notwithstanding all their spinning and weaving, all their plotting and devising, the next broom that comes will sweep away all their webs, and the spiders too, except they creep apace. God loves and delights to cross worldly proverbs and worldly craft. Joseph Carrill, 1647. Henry Smith wrote in 1578, they banded themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. But why did they band themselves against the Lord or against his anointed? What was their desire of him, to have his goods? No, he had none for himself. But they were richer than he. To have his liberty? Nay, that would not suffice them, for they had bound him before. To bring the people to dislike of him? Nay, that would not serve them, for they had done so already, until even his disciples were fled from him. What would they have then, his blood? Yea, they took counsel, says Matthew, to put him to death. They had the devil's mind, which is not satisfied but with death. And how did they contrive it? He saith, they took counsel about it. David Pitcairn in 1851, writing on verse 2, Against Jehovah and against his anointed. What an honor it was to David to be thus publicly associated with Jehovah. And because he was his anointed, to be an object of hatred and scorn to the ungodly world. If this very circumstance fearfully augmented the guilt and sealed the doom of these infatuated heathen, Surely it was that which, above everything else, would preserve the mind of David calm and serene, yea, peaceful and joyful, notwithstanding the proud and boastful vauntiness of his enemies. When writing this psalm, David was like a man in a storm, who hears only the roaring of the tempest, or sees nothing but the raging billow threatening destruction on every side of him. And yet his faith enabled him to say, the people imagine a vain thing. They cannot succeed. They cannot defeat the counsels of heaven. They cannot injure the Lord's anointed. Verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens. Arthur Jackson, 1643, says, Hereby it is clearly intimated first that the Lord is far above all their malice and power. Number two, that he sees all their plots, looking down on it all. Number three, that he is of omnipotent power, and so can do with his enemies as he lists. 
Our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he pleased. Matthew Henry says, He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, and so on. Sinners' follies are just a sport of God's infinite wisdom and power. And those attempts of the kingdom of Satan, which in our eyes are formidable, in his are despicable. The Puritan Thomas Adams says, They scoff at us. God laughs at them. Laugh? This seems a hard word at the first view. Are the injuries of his saints, the cruelties of their enemies, the derision, the persecution of all that are round about us, no more but matter of laughter? Severe Cato thought that laughter did not become the gravity of Roman consuls, that it is a diminution of states, as another told princes, and it is attributed to the majesty of heaven. According to our capacities, a prophet describes God, as ourselves would be in a merry disposition, deriding vain attempts. God laughs, but it is in scorn. He scorns, but it is with vengeance. Pharaoh imagined that by drowning the Israelite males, he had found a way to root their name from the earth. But when at the same time his own daughter in his own court gave princely education to Moses, their deliverer, did not God laugh? Short is the joy of the wicked. Is Dagon put up to his place again? God's smile shall take off his head and his hands and leave him neither wit to guide nor power to subsist. We may not judge of God's works until the fifth act, the case deplorable and desperate in outward appearance, may with one smile from heaven find a blessed issue. He permitted his temple to be sacked and rifled, the holy vessels to be profaned and caroused in, but did not God smile, make Belshazzar to tremble at the handwriting on the wall? Oh, what are his frowns, if his smiles are so terrible? David Pitcairn says, The expression, He that sits in the heavens, at once fixes our thoughts on a being infinitely exalted above man, who is of the earth, earthy, and when it is said, he shall laugh, this word is designed to convey to our minds the idea that the greatest confederacies amongst kings and peoples, and their most extensive and vigorous preparations, to defeat his purposes, or to injure his servants, are in his sight altogether insignificant and worthless. He looks upon their poor and puny efforts, not only without uneasiness or fear, but he laughs at their folly. He treats their impotency with derision. He knows how he can crush them like a moth when he pleases, or consume them in a moment with the breath of his mouth. How profitable it is for us to be reminded of truths such as these. Ah, oh, it is indeed a vain thing for the potsherds of the earth to strive with the glorious majesty of heaven. Martin Luther on verse 4 says, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh at them. The Lord shall have them in derision. This tautology or repetition of the same thing, which is frequent in the scriptures, is a sign of the thing being established according to the authority of the patriarch, Joseph. Genesis forty-one thirty-two. Where having interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh, he said, and for that, the dream was doubled on to Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. And therefore, here also, shall laugh at them, and shall have them in derision. It is a repetition to show that there is not a doubt to be entertained that all these things will most surely come to pass. And the gracious Spirit does all this for our comfort and consolation, that we may not faint under temptation, but lift up our heads with a most certain hope, because he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Hebrews 10, verse 37. John Trapp, 
on the words, vex them. Says either by horror of conscience or corporal plagues. One way or the other, he will have his pennyworths of them, as he always has had the persecutors of his people. William Plumer, in his commentary on Psalms, on Psalm 2, verses 5 and 9, It is easy for God to destroy his foes. Behold Pharaoh, his wise men, his hosts, and his horses plowing and plunging and sinking like lead in the Red Sea. Here is the end of one of the greatest plots ever formed against God's chosen. Of thirty Roman emperors, governors of provinces, and others high in office, who distinguished themselves by their zeal and bitterness in persecuting the early Christians, one became speedily deranged after some atrocious cruelty. One was slain by his own son. One became blind, the eyes of one started out of his head. One was drowned. One was strangled. One died in a miserable captivity. One fell dead in a manner that will not bear a recital. One died of so loathsome a disease that several of his physicians were put to death because they could not abide the stench that filled his room. Two committed suicide. A third attempted it, but had to call for help to finish the work. Five were assassinated by their own people or servants. Five others died the most miserable and excruciating deaths, several of them having an untold complication of diseases, and eight were killed in battle or after being taken prisoners. Among these was Julian the Apostate. In the days of his prosperity, he is said to have pointed his dagger to heaven, defying the Son of God, whom he commonly called the Galilean. But when he was wounded in battle, he saw that all was over with him, and he gathered up his clotted blood and threw it into the air, exclaiming, Thou hast conquered, O thou Galilean. Voltaire has told us of the agonies of Charles the Ninth of France, which drove the blood through the pores of the skin of that miserable monarch after his cruelties and treacheries to the Huguenots. William Plumer, 1867. On Psalm 2, verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. David Pitcairn wrote, The rod has a variety of meanings in Scripture. It might be of different materials, as it was employed for different purposes. At an early period, a wooden rod came into use as one of the insignia of royalty, under the name of scepter. By degrees, the scepter grew in importance and was regarded as characteristic of an empire, or of the reign of some particular king. A golden scepter denoted wealth in pomp. The right or straight scepter, of which we read in Psalm 45, verse 6, is expressive of the justice and uprightness, the truth and equity which shall distinguish Messiah's reign after his kingdom on earth has been established. But when it is said in Revelation 19, verse 15, that he whose name is called the word of God will smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron, if the rod signifies his scepter, then the iron of which it is made must be designed to express the severity of the judgments which the omnipotent king of kings will inflict on all who resist his authority. But to me it appears doubtful whether the rod of iron symbolizes the royal scepter of the Son of God at his second advent. It is mentioned in connection with a sharp sword, which leads me to prefer the opinion that it also ought to be regarded as a weapon of war. At all events, a rod of iron mentioned in the psalm we are endeavoring to explain is evidently not the emblem of sovereign power, although represented as in the hands of a king, but an instrument of correction and punishment. In this sense, the word rod is often used. When the correcting rod, which usually was a wand or cane, is represented as in the second psalm, to be of iron, it only indicates how weighty, how severe, how effectual the threatened chastisement will be. It will not merely bruise, but it will break. 
thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Now it is just such a complete breaking as would not readily be effected excepting by an iron rod, that is more fully expressed in the following clause of the verse, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The completeness of the destruction, however, depends upon two things. Even an iron rod, if gently used or used against a hard and firm substance, might cause little injury. But in the case before us, it is supposed to be applied with great force. Thou shalt dash them, and it is applied to what will prove as brittle and fragile as a potter's vessel. Thou shalt dash them in pieces. Here, as in other respects, we must feel that the predictions and promises of the psalm were but very partially fulfilled in the history of the literal David. Their real accomplishment, their awful completion, abides the day when the spiritual David shall come in glory and in majesty as Zion's king with a rod of iron a dash in pieces, the great anti-Christian confederacy of kings and peoples and to take possession of its long-promised and dearly purchased inheritance. And the signs of the time seem to indicate that the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Preaching on the words in verse 10, Be wise now, therefore, O you kings, and so on. As Jesus is king of kings and judge of judges, so the gospel is a teacher of the greatest and wisest. If any are so great as to spurn its admonitions, God will make little of them. And if they are so wise as to despise its teachings, their fancied wisdom shall make fools of them. The gospel takes a high tone before the rulers of the earth, and they who preach it should, like John Knox in Melville, magnify their office by bold rebukes and manly utterances, even in the royal presence. A clerical sycophant, is only fit to be a scullion in the devil's kitchen. Kiss the Son, verse 12, Thomas Adams, to make peace with the Father. Kiss the Son. Let him kiss me was the church's prayer in Canticles 1, verse 2. Let us kiss him that be our endeavor. Indeed, the Son must first kiss us by his mercy before we can kiss him by our piety. Lord, grant in these mutual kisses and interchangeable embraces now that we may come to the plenary wedding supper hereafter. Joseph Carrill, on verse 12. If his wrath be kindled but a little, the Hebrew word is, if his nose or nostril be kindled but a little, the nostril being an organ of the body in which wrath shows itself, is put for wrath itself. Paleness and snuffling of the nose are symptoms of anger. In our proverbials, to take a thing in snuff is to take it in anger. John Newton says on his wrath, Unspeakable must the wrath of God be when it is kindled fully, since perdition may come upon the kindling of it but a little. Psalm 2, The Treasury of David, 